Hello, everyone, um, and welcome uh, to the Brooklyn Rails 467th New Social Environment. I'm Anya, the events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Rudy Valdez and Reverend Dr. Donna Schaefer. We're thrilled to welcome poet Elizabeth Lothian here to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. The Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Bunsi, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions, which I will post shortly. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Emmy award-winning filmmaker Rudy Valdez is committed to creating social, cultural, and political stories through a cinematic and meaningful lens. He is the director of The Sentence. For this work, Valdez won the 2019 Primetime Emmy Award for Exceptional Merit in Documentary Filmmaking, U.S. Documentary Audience Award at the 2018 Sundance Film Festival, and was a 2018 Critics' Choice Documentary Awards Best New Director nominee. And community builder Reverend Dr. Donna Shaper served as Senior Minister of Judson Memorial Church from 2006 I think, apologies, I think that Anya may have frozen. Uh, yes, and I've got knocked off too. Apologies uh, for that. So oh dear. Oh dear. I think I dear. think you both are back now. Oh, phew. Okay. Oh, yeah. did I freeze? Sorry, just yeah. momentarily, but. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe this is a good transition, then we'll just pass the mic right over to you, Donna, <laughs> to, to kick us off. Going. Okay, while we have each other, welcome everyone. Um, today it is my privilege to introduce to you all Rudy Valdez, filmmaker, activist, um, and uncle and brother. And uh, some of us have had the chance to look at the sentence and others may not have yet, but I have a feeling you're going to want to as soon as we get done with this. I've watched it twice because the first time I got upset about somebody I know who was almost exactly in the lead character, Cindy's situation. And she ended up watching it uh, afar and we started talking about it and it was very heavy for us. And then I decided I better watch it again <laughs> and see what, and be more objective. So I girded my loins, all seven of them and came back and watched it. And Rudy, I love it. Um, and when we had a chat before this session, I said I was going to ask you this question first. Why'd you do it? What what made you deal with this radical injustice so beautifully? Yeah, thank you for the introductions and thank you, uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Donna Che, for being here. And uh, I'm very humbled and, and privileged to be here and to speak about this film. You know, the, this film really for me came out of necessity. You know, I grew up feeling like I didn't have a voice, feeling like uh, I was underrepresented and um, I came from a community that was co consistently you know underrepresented and, and all I ever wanted was this idea that I was going to be able to control the narrative of my life and as I look to media as I look to the thing you know as, as we do as, as kids growing up I looked out into the world of media and I tried to find where I fit in and who I was and and what represented me out there I continued to find people who looked like me to be uh, perpetuated in these tropes of you know, you're going to go to jail, you're going to be this, you're going to be that, you're going to be all these things. And I, I didn't accept that for myself. I didn't want that for myself. So I was always looking for these ways to have a voice. And I was a writer and I was an actor and I was trying to do all these things. And I had moved to New York um, and I was doing pretty well as, as an actor and, and a writer. And I actually had become a kindergarten teacher. I was a theater teacher. I was a basketball coach. I was doing all these things. And then, you know, this thing happened to my sister, um, you know, she was found guilty of conspiracy six years after the, you know, crime had taken place. And in that time, she had, you know, come to me and, and the rest of my family, you know, after uh, the initial crime. And, you know, she was unsure of what to do with her life. And we encouraged her, listen, listen, you have the ability to change things. You have the ability to turn your life around. You've made mistakes. And she took that to heart and she said, listen, I'm going to change my life. She got a great job. She eventually met another 
uh, partner and they got married, they had two kids, she was pregnant with their third when, you know, five and a half, six years later, the federal government comes and says, we're going to put you on trial for this thing that happened six years ago for this thing that you had a tangential part of. And so all that being said, she was found guilty. While she was on trial, she was, she was pregnant with their third, they allowed her to go home and have her child and she came back uh, for, for sentencing and they sentenced her to 15 years for her first time nonviolent offense with a five week old and two other young uh, daughters. And I remember being in that courtroom and looking around and thinking to myself, you know, as the federal marshals came down and grabbed her and were taking her away, you know, somebody has to say something, somebody has to do something. And I did a glance of the room and I quickly realized nobody was going to do that. Nobody was going to stand up and say, this is wrong and we need to fight for, for uh, this injustice that has happened. So I, I said to myself, I didn't know what it meant, but I was going to figure it out and I was going to fight for my sister. And so I didn't immediately say, well, I'm going to go and make a documentary film because I wasn't a documentary filmmaker. I didn't know the first thing about it, um, but I, I, I vowed to figure out what was going on. And so subsequently I started going to Washington DC immediately trying to talk to as many lawyers and as many things. And and what I wanted for my sister throughout that process until I figured out how to right this wrong or figure out this injustice, I was going to film moments of her kids because I knew that one day when she came out, I wanted her to be able to watch them grow up. I wanted her to be, and it wasn't for a documentary, it was simply me wanting her to one day be able to see life, to see them running around and crying and fighting and yelling and screaming and all the things that we take for granted as parents. And um, one day, you know, and I was living in New York at the time, sort of putting this career together of all these other things. And um, my oldest niece, Cindy's oldest daughter, had a dance recital. And I was living in New York. And I remember the ticket back to uh, Detroit was something like $380 round trip. And I had like $420 in my bank account. And I said, I have to go back. I have to capture this for Cindy. So I flew back. And the first day I'm there, I'm filming... Autumn get ready. And this is the first scene in the film, completely organically, completely unknown. Like I, I wasn't expecting it. I almost turned the camera off because I, I, it felt weird to me, but Cindy calls and she has a conversation with her older daughter, Autumn. And she says, do you know what mommy is going to do while you go to dance? I'm going to lay down in my bed. I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to think about you. And in that moment, watching Autumn's reaction, watching that connection that was going on, something struck me and it said, this is the story, this is the, the part that people don't understand, the human behind these sentences, the human behind this war on drugs, the humans behind mass incarceration, and more importantly, the children and the family the communities left behind. So I decided at that point, I'm going to figure out how to tell this story. And I quit everything. I fired my acting managers. I quit teaching, I quit coaching, I quit everything, and I dedicated my life to figuring out how to become a filmmaker to tell this story. That's the origin of this entire film. I have the privilege of saying this is the moment that I decided I was going to be a filmmaker. And, and to, be, to be an uncle, to, to be a, a family member who sees this, this mandatory sentencing crap, which is horrifying. It's the dumbest legislation, most cruel legislation, that I think we have, and we have a lot of cruel legislation. Don't ever forget that. Uh, I mean, uh, solitary, for example, what's going on at Rikers. I mean, so many other things. And I, I wanna talk about in some ways, what a great, Cindy is such a great human being in reality that when she found out, it has a happy ending. When she found out that she was getting some good news from the system, but she was the, uh, I don't know, uh, 1,800 people out of 35,000, Rudy, forgive me for the figures, but they're pretty close, right? Yeah, yeah. But got, got a clemency, finally, after this torturous time when one of her uh, children said, well, I guess I'll see my mom when she's done with 15 years uh, when I'm 16, right? Look at that math. Yeah. What a way to learn math. Uh, but, you know, back to the opening scene, it's very dramatic and it tells you, you wanna be a part of this. You wanna see this kid dance. You want her uncle to see her dance. You want her mother to lie in bed and pray for her while she's dancing. 
So you get set up. And then the other thing I really noticed about uh, the intimacy of it was at a certain point you ask if you can interview her when you're done <laughs> interviewing. So you, she, he does mutual interviewing. Say more about that technique. How did that occur? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting because again, I I was figuring it out. I was figuring out this entire process of of, of filmmaking and what it meant right. to be a filmmaker. And I think one of the things that I, I caught on to early on, and I think it's something that I've carried through to the rest of my career and everything that I do is that, you know, if I'm asking people to be open and honest and vulnerable and tell their stories, and I need to do the same, I need to be the same way. And so in, in any pr production that I'm on, it's, it's, I wear my heart on my sleeve and I'm an open book and, and it's never about me going in and finding someone's story. It's about us sharing it each other's stories and understanding where we intersect as storytellers, as people putting things out into the world. And so that was something that I, I wanted them to feel like they were a part of that process, that it wasn't just me grilling them and trying to find the sensational story, but it was about us trying to find this common ground and understand from each other what was going on, because in a major way, we were all figuring it out. And so we needed to understand each other's feelings and where we were and why we were there. Yeah. Well, the art of, of mutuality uh, elicits in the child <laughs> um, so, so much articulation. How does yeah. it feel? It feels really bad. Uh, yeah. well, how do you I mean, explain what happened? I, I, yeah. I will to this day, you know, I, I didn't know what I was sitting on there. You know, uh, I, I've but, had the great pleasure of, of having, of turning this into a career this this and and working with a lot of of different people and a lot of kids and i have yet to come across children like autumn ava and anna in their ability to articulate how they were feeling and i think part of that was because they were so comfortable with me but just having that language and having that ability to say it like it, it i didn't know what i had at the time i didn't understand uh the what what now we would call documentary gold you know, but it, at the time it was just me chatting with my nieces the way I normally do. And, and, and because I always had a camera, because I, I, I made that not the focal point of why I, why I was there, it happened to have a camera in my hand, but it was about our conversations. We were able to create these moments where the girls felt comfortable enough and confident enough to say what was in their heart. And that's, that's the real, you know, baseline of this entire project. And it is amazing how, again, articulate the children are. T tell us uh, when you said, what do you, how do you think, what do you think happened to mommy? What, what she said? Yeah, I mean, she, she had, we're, we're talking about Autumn and, you know, I, I remember, I, one of the things that I didn't want to do when I went to go and interview her was I, I didn't want to do, and I never do this in my projects anyways, but I didn't want to do like a pre-interview to be like, Hey, like, so if I ask you this question about mommy, mm -hmm. what do you think you would say? I didn't want to do that. I mm -hmm. wanted to have an honest, you know, first gut reaction to what was going on. And, and at the same time, mm -hmm. I wanted the questions and the approach not to feel like you really need to answer this question. I needed it to feel like, listen, you're, you're in a really, really safe space here. And we're, we're, we're doing this not for each other, we're doing this for other kids who are going through this. And that's part of the interview that didn't go through it. Like part of this was about talking to them about understanding that they weren't alone, understanding that there are so many other kids who are going through this and, and, and trying to figure that out and understand that. And so Autumn's response was, you know, she had a very kind of um, interesting analogy that she understood within her language that, you know, Cindy was with other kids who were doing bad things and she knew and she didn't tell. So she got in trouble for doing those things, which is a pretty good explanation of what conspiracy is. You know, as, as much as so many people struggle, she had a really firm grasp of, of the situation. And, and I credit a lot of that to Cindy because Cindy, knowing how hard it was going to be, especially at the beginning and, and probably throughout, was always open and honest about what she did. She took responsibility for her actions and she let her children know where she was and what was going on because she feared that if I lie to them, if I say mommy's 
in the army or mommy's away at school or mommy's at a job that one day she's going to have to explain the lies. And she was like, I don't want to lie to them. And as difficult as it is for them to try to grasp this now and understand this now, mm -hmm. in the long run, they're going to be better for it. And they, they, they were able to start that process of grieving and absence much earlier so that it prolonged as opposed to having. So, you know, I credit a lot of their understanding and their ability to speak about their feelings with Cindy because she put a lot of work and Adam for that matter. They both put a ton of work into always understanding the girl's feelings and giving them that, that platform to always share their feelings. So they had that language. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, it's, it's beautifully done. And the fact that it has a happy ending is complex for me. Say, likewise. And yeah, I mean, I, I think about that all the time. You know, I think about the ending and, you know, right. this idea of, of this, this, this broad idea of justice and, and what that means. Because, you know, there were so many people who came to me prior and was like, here is justice. You finally earned justice. And I said, no, no, no we we figured out that we're going to be able to try and get life back a little sooner than we thought, but this is not justice. Justice would have been that the system worked right the first time. That's justice. We have so many people. I've done other projects with, with children with incarcerated parents. I just did a project with Maya Moore and Jonathan Irons uh, mm -hmm. for ESPN's 30 for 30. Jonathan Irons mm -hmm. was wrongfully convicted at 16, did 23 and a half years in prison before he was let off on a technicality, really, on, on a loophole that they figured out that they were hiding um, evidence that really said that he was innocent. And, you know, he, he is freed on that uh, through a Brady violation. Everyone's like, justice. And I'm like, no, no, no. Justice is 23 and a half years ago when that young man was sitting in front. And, you know, I, I think about that all of the time. And, one of the other sort of nagging things that happens to me and that really pushed me throughout the process, the 10 year process of making this film was that I took Cindy's transcripts. I talked to lawyers, I talked to legislators, I talked to judges, I talked to prosecutors, I talked to defense attorneys throughout that 10 years. And I showed them the case. I showed them what was going on and time after time after time, I was told the same thing. If your family had money, your sister would not have gone to prison. And that was one of the toughest things for me to continue to hear because that is not justice. That is not justice for anybody. And so we, we took this story, we took what happened to my sister and we made the best that we could out of it. But um, nobody can give back all those years, that, those 10 years to those girls. Right. Now that becomes the poignant part of it is that every minute, you know, it, who said it? I don't know, some famous person. Every missed opportunity is an opportunity missed. Every opportunity presents the possibility of a missed opportunity. Yeah. So, and I think about this around climate change all the time. You know, every day that that clock ticks and we're not doing something to stop it, it is bad. Every day that a child doesn't have an active parent, every day. Yeah. And then every year, it is an opportunity missed i'm sure we think about it if you have children under COVID now you know they're missing these developmental milestones yeah. and of course there are other developmental milestones happening you know we don't need to go totally nuts children are remarkably resilient as as your kids are yeah um, but but missing that kind of time is a tragedy and people need to rub their noses in it and feel it and i think the film helps you do that without being maudlin. And the children also, you know how we accuse each other sometimes of, you know, you're playing the victim card now, or you're doing the victim role, get, get out of my life. I don't want to hear this about you. The children don't do that. They just express sadness and grief yeah. Yeah. Uh, with self-victimization, which is very interesting. And Yeah, and I think called? like part of that is, is due to the fact that it happened that they were so young, especially, you know, there, there's a, there's a really heartbreaking conversation that I had with Autumn off camera um, that part of me is like, Oh, I wish I would have captured that because it would have been, <laughs> you know, and she, and she says it in the, in the film in, in a roundabout way, but, you know, she basically is like, listen, I know what it means to have mom here, you know, and, in. Ava and Anna don't really because they were so young. And she said, 
I more importantly know what it means to not have mom here. She said, and that hurts, yeah. you know? And so not to take anything away from Ava and Anna because they had their whole thing, but Autumn was at an age where she really processed that grief and understood that there's a big difference between mom being here and mom not being here. And, um, you know, that's tough, you know, what, you know, this, and this sort of leads to, to this, this sort of piggybacks on that, you know, one of the things, especially when uh, the first, the film first came out, the question that I received a ton, a ton, a ton was, how are the girls doing? How are the girls doing? How are the girls doing? And they must be so happy. They must be so happy. And I said, no, they're, they're extremely happy to, to have their mother home. But um, the, the answer to how they're doing is very unknown. I was like, you know, they've just lost 10 years of, of growth and development from their mother that is, that is different from most people. And they've, they've, they've navigated a life that's sort of on a different path. I said, I think that, and this is part of why we make the film and why we continue to talk about it is that we don't know what this did to these girls. We won't know for five or 10 years until they're heading into adulthood and navigating adult relationships and navigating all of these other things that we are able to have that guidance from two parents or have that guidance and not have this dealing with this loss continuously in our life. Like, so, and we're seeing that now, we're seeing that with them as they're heading, you know, Autumn just graduated high school and Ava and Anna are, you know, Ava's a sophomore in high school and Anna's in eighth grade and they're heading into young adulthood and we're seeing the effects that this 10 years had on them. And it's not their fault. It's, it, you know, it's, it, it, they're, they're doing the best that they can, but the, the ramifications of these laws and these sentences and, and tearing families apart, it's long lasting. And that's the thing that we, we have to continue to think about. I, I sometimes equate prison sentences to, or, or, or these big drug busts, uh, especially to sending people off to war. You know, we have these giant headlines that we say, listen, we're going off to fight this valiant war for these great big things. But what we forget about are the individuals that we're sending off to war. We're not welcoming them back with the same fanfare. We're not saying, come back, you've done this amazing thing. And now let us help you transition back into life and let you be the people, the, the best people that you can possibly be. We're forgetting about them. The same way we, you know, when my sister was sent away, they didn't say Cynthia Shank, mother of who, mother of whatever, whatever her thing is. They said, this amount of drugs, this amount of guns, this amount of money off the street. We're sending people away for hundreds of years. That's the headline. And they send people away and, and the general public thinks, thinks, look at these hardened criminals who are being put away. There's no way we're ever going to change these laws. What they don't think about is what that does to the community and the people left behind. And more importantly, how somebody is supposed to do 10, 15, 20, 25 years and then come back and you say, now be a productive member of society, even though we've taken all of us away from you. We've alienated you from your family. We've taken all of your skills away. Our country, our world has you know, moved forward, you know, in technology so far that you cannot find a job, you cannot do anything, but be a productive member of society. We need to invest in people coming home the same way, same way we invest in sending people away. Yep. 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 What made you choose the, uh, the sentence as the title? What were the rival titles? Uh, so the, the working title for a very long time was Mommy's House, um, <laughs> because that's what Autumn used to call the prison, Mommy's House. Um, I think that we, we, you know, one of my producers actually came up with the title of a sentence and he actually, I think just signed in his name, Sam Visby, you can see him right there. Um, but he, you know, he came up with the title of a sentence and it was, it was wonderful because it was something that was simple. It was, it was the sentence, which meant that the sentence could have been for Cindy. The sentence could have been for the family. The sentence could have been for, you know, everyone does this sentence. And, and when you look at the film as a whole, you're realizing that it's not just Cindy's sentence, that everybody's doing this sentence. So it's, it's literally the sentence has, has come yeah. over this entire <laughs> community. And um, yeah, I think it really encapsulated the sort of simplicity of our storytelling and what yeah. we were hoping to do with it. I like that. That's good. That's good. And and what was it like for you learning the new language of film? Was it you know hard? it was it was interesting. It it was very difficult. But you know I I say I say all the time you know it as a, as a writer and a and a and an actor and sort of a storyteller my entire life I had this I had this sort of back 
bone in me of, of a storyteller all of the time. It was something that I had, I had worked at for a very long time. I'd never done it in a visual medium before where I was the one sort of controlling that. So the first thing I needed to do is figure out what is it about me that is, the, or, or, or how am I going to figure out how to take what is inside of me, what's in my heart, and put it out into the world. And because I was not satisfied with just let me take a camera and capture these moments and move around and get it, get everyone in a, in a medium shot. I needed to figure out what that was. And so um, if somebody were to watch me the first like a year or two of, of trying to navigate the film world and understand what that meant and what my visual language was, they probably would have thought I was a serial killer or something. But um, I, I did this thing where I, I, and I do this at many, times in my life I've done this many I just did it a, a, about a week ago but when I'm when I'm struggling or trying to figure out a new creative outlet I will think of what that is what I'm trying to do and I free write I give myself 10 minutes and I free write and I free write and I free write and then I and it's just whatever's coming to my head and when I said how am I I said to myself how am I going to tell this story in a way that matters and I yeah. started to free write and all of these song lyrics and uh, movies I remembered and scenes and like very like they all started just coming to my head things throughout my life that meant something to me and I had to figure out what is it that meant that that, that made these things mean something to me so I would sometimes like there are scenes in movies where it's literally 10 seconds that for some reason popped up in my head I would watch them a hundred times I'd rewind it watch it rewind it watch it I'd say where are the lights what is the camera? Where's the camera? What's going on? Why do I care? Was it the costume? Is it the focal point? Is it all these things? And I slowly started to figure out, and this is maybe a trick for any of uh, um, the filmmakers who might be in attendance, like to me, what I figured out was lens placement and eyeline and where that person is telling the story from and who they're telling it to. You know, we see so many projects where somebody is telling you this heartfelt thing and they're telling it to you like this. And I was like, that's not engaging to me. I want somebody to look at me. I want to feel like I'm in there. And quickly, very quickly, I realized yeah. the biggest asset I had was that I wasn't telling the story as a voyeur. I wasn't telling the story as some sort of producer or director who was coming in to tell the story. I was the brother. I was the uncle. I was yeah. the son. And I needed to place you in that. And so yep. I figured out my visual style was putting a prime lens on the front using a camera mic, which forced me to come close and be within the scenes that you're in. So you're not watching this, this journey from afar. You're taking this journey with the family. And I yeah. wanted that to always feel like it was there. I wanted to place you in there. And like part of that comes with making it an apolitical film, not saying like the right or the left is, is responsible for anything, not yes. saying that this is woe is me, that th these are facts. Yes. And also, you know, leaving in these little bits, like there's this moment when my mom is, is talking and she's talking about the moon and how she looks at the moon because she knows, and like none of that was prompted. That was literally just me <laughs> talking with my mom, watching her. And then she looks at the camera and she says, I'm gonna put your laundry in. And it's a reset to remind you, even though we've just got into this heady emotional space, oh. you're the brother, you're the son, you're the family, you're being let in on this journey. And so intimacy is where I hang my hat in, in, in trust and honesty and vulnerability. You know, I, I needed to always have that and find that in, 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 in this project and in every project that I do. Yeah, I really like that. Um because it was a remarkable um, testimony to family to watch you and your sibling. Yeah. You know, I, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you in a little aside that I think, you know, yeah. I, I, uh, I don't think I've ever told a story without crying. I'm gonna really try right now, but you know, the, the, I made this film for nine and a half years and, and, I, and I tried really hard to, to figure out how to become a filmmaker. And I carved out all this like other career during the process, but really I was, I was fighting and trying and trying and trying. And, you know, by some miracle, by some whatever, we got into the Sundance Film Festival. You know, yeah. we got into Sundance with 15,000 other films that had submitted you know, we got into competition, we got, you know, all the, the sort of dream scenario. And I remember calling my parents individually and talking and telling them what had happened. And I called my mom and I said, mom, uh, I got into 
Sundance with the sentence and so they, they hadn't even seen it yet. They didn't, they, right. you know, I didn't show anybody anything until right before Sundance and my mom's response was, oh, Miho, I'm so proud of you. Can we do it in New York? I love coming to New York. And I was like, you know, I, I think that they're set on Park City, but we'll, I'll, I'll ask Robert Redford if we can move to New York for you, but uh, <laughs> plan to go to Utah. And, you know, and I called my dad and I said the same thing. I was like, dad, we, I got into Sundance and, you know, I hope you can come and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, oh, that's okay. Like they didn't really know what it meant. And I was like, okay. And, you know, so I hung up and, and my sister called my dad. She told me that she called my dad and she explained to him what it meant, you know, that. That this little story that, that started as, as complete need for voice and agency and fighting turned turn into this larger thing that uh, is being accepted at the best film festival in the world for documentary. <laughs> and uh, sorry. And my dad called me back immediately and he understood sort of the gravity of, of what was going on and, and, and what, what it really meant. And he just kept saying to me, and he was crying and he just kept saying to me, how did you know? How did you know? How did you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I said to him, you know, and this goes back to what you were talking about, what, 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 what sparked the story in me is, I said to him, dad, I didn't know I didn't know that this film would ever be done. I didn't know that anybody would ever see this movie. I didn't know that we would ever get into Sundance. I didn't know any of these things were going to happen. I didn't, I didn't know any, I didn't know the ending. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I said, but what I did know was that as a family, we were about to embark on at the time I thought was 15 of the hardest years of our family's life. And what I did know was that we were going to be very proud of how we came out on the other end. And I wanted to capture that. So, yeah, so, you know, th that's what drove me throughout the entire process. So I'm thinking about the, uh, I just want to give you a minute too. You know, I'm good, not, I'm good. We're not uh, I'm thinking about the, the religious notion of the hero's journey, uh, which some of you would know is kind of the famous, uh, yeah, you know, all the, all the great gods have a hero journey. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and films also have hero's journey. And many people today are rightly, I think, critical of the hero's journey um, out of, of genuine respect for disabilities on how, you know, by the way, not everybody gets over polio. <laughs> not everybody gets out of jail. Not everybody gets clemency. Uh, you know, it's a real, there's survivor guilt is not, um, it's not a fiction. It's a real thing. Yeah. Why, uh, why not her? You know, I survived breast cancer for 22 years now and I've lost five close friends. And every time one goes, I think really? why you know yeah. and fate chance luck blah blah and you you turned an ordinary situation into a heroic and heroic situation uh and you even let the government do something good for a change you know i mean it's like yeah you know, they even had a, a role to play and um uh, i I think that the important thing that you just said in your testimony with your father was, I didn't know. The whole time I didn't know. And nor did the children know, nor did Cindy know. You know, you don't know that things are gonna be okay. And all sorts of idiots tell you, pastors especially, everything's gonna be okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, it's not always for everyone. So oh, how how do you how do we live in that uncertainty and, and get out of bed in the morning? I mean, you figured it out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, you know I can only speak to my own experience, and you know uh, 
I, I, I struggled a lot um, growing up in a lot of different ways. And, you know, one of the things that I struggled with um, a lot was people because, because I, you know, I, I lived in this sort of middle road where, you know, I was a person of color and I lived in a very mixed community and um, I wasn't brown enough for the people in my neighborhood and I wasn't white enough for the people outside of my neighborhood. I constantly lived in this middle road all the time. And, um, and this goes to one of the biggest things that I've discovered about myself is like, I, ha I had to figure out how to be okay and set my own parameters of what success meant. And I also had to understand what it meant to fail and navigating my, my life around failure and what failure meant and what failure meant in my next steps in life was really huge for me. You know, I, um, my parents sent me to a private school after fifth grade because they felt as though, um, you know, to, to be fair to them, they were like, we think you're very smart and you have a gift and we can't afford it, but they sacrificed everything to send me to this private school. And day one at that private school, I was otherized. I was asked to stand up and say, listen, they said, listen, we've never had anyone from, you know, your neighborhood in our school before. Can you tell us what that's like? And immediately they put me in a different world. They put me in a different category than everybody. And it forced me, I was there for two years. It forced me to understand that I wasn't like the other people at that school. And I got the worst grades in my life, sixth and seventh grade. Mm. And at the end of seventh grade, they were, they were finally like, we don't want you back at this school. And so I went back to public school and uh, with all of the kids from my neighborhood and stuff. And I had to figure out how to navigate that world again after being taken out of it. And I failed the eighth grade. And my parents used to really yell at me and, and I shouldn't say yell, but they were very upset with me all the time. And we had arguments about my grades because they, you know, they always believe like you're smarter than this. Like oh, what's going on? You're failing eighth grade. And I, I'll never forget the day that I failed the eighth grade um, sitting in this little kitchen that we had above a store. We didn't have any power. We didn't have anything. I remember we had the oven open because we had gas and that's how we were heating that little room. And having to tell my parents, you know, I failed the eighth grade and my dad standing in the doorway and my mom sitting across from me and they don't yell and they don't scream and they, they aren't upset with me. They just, they had a look on their face of failure. And I, at 13, I remember looking at them and not fully having this like grandiose moment, but understanding that the failure wasn't theirs, that the failure, um, was mine and, and you know it was at that moment that I said I don't know what what I'm going to do with my life I don't know what what is going to happen to me but I need to make sure they're proud that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and part of that is understanding the sacrifice that they had done for me and so you know it took a long time for me to figure out what that is but I started to change within me the parameters of success and what it meant to continue to move forward because I failed many times after that. I fail all the time. I fail on a daily basis, but it's like that failure of eighth grade was me being able to learn that it's okay for me to navigate and, and take my own path. And uh, it meant, you know, so right then I was like, I'm not going to hang out with all the same kids that have caused me trouble this entire year. So for a year, it meant I didn't have a single friend, uh, not a friend. You know, I spent summer inside and my mom used to say, why aren't you all hanging out with your friends? And I said, because I can't, because I need to figure out what is going on. And it, it took, I needed to figure out who I was and what was going on. And so, you know, all that leads up to the sentence, all that leads up to, you know, all of these, these decisions and, 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 and things that I did in my life to, to navigate me to this moment where I get to, to, to have this story in front of me that I put out there. And I could say, listen, I could take on all of these other people's notes and ideas of what makes this film better. Or what I can do is I can own my life, my filtration system as a director, as a storyteller, as a person, and say for better or worse, this film is going to be emblematic of who I am as a storyteller. And if that means it's a failure, I know where I stand. If it means that mm -hmm. I am successful with it, I know where I stand and it gives me the confidence to continue to tell stories. And so, but that, that isn't something that I came to like that. That is something that I came to through many years of trial and error and understanding that 
I needed to navigate that for myself and for my family. So it's, it's a long road, you know, it's, it's a long and winding road, as they say, you know, and, and yep. we have to figure that out and just, you know, we don't know what's coming. I don't know what's coming next year, but I do know in that process, I'm going to be proud of how I navigate the next year. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well said. I think we relate. So maybe we'll take a few questions. Uh, I think uh, we want to make sure you get out like about five of one because we want to get them on a plane. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't oh, want to be you, responsible yeah. for any more failure. <laughs> I'll just learn from it. I'll learn from it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Anybody have a question uh, in the chat or uh, on yeah, your, we, can you watch the chat? Yeah, we have a few questions, um, but I want to go Good. to Fong Gui over at the rail first. Um, uh -huh. So Good. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Rudy. Thanks, Fong. Thank you for having me. It's uh, amazing. It's uh, when Donna was mentioning about, you know, the hero journey, uh, it's a fantastic um, series, of course. However controversial it, it, some people think today, it was very useful. Uh, it's very important mm -hmm. to have a um, yes. strong series there that have some resonance for sure. Uh, you know, and as I grew up in Vietnam, Rudy, uh, my grandmother was very important to me, who was a Buddhist practitioner. She once say when I was 10 years old, she say, when you grow up grandson, you will suffer just like anyone else's in this earth. Don't ever think <laughs> you're suffering more unique than theirs, but make right. sure you suffer the right way. I had no idea what she meant the right way, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> me either. Yeah, <laughs> But to your point about your friend having not able to survive breast cancer, but you did. And mm. I think that it's really essential to the whole notion of courage, you know, even without luck or with luck. One has to be, um, I would say, uh, sort of mindful of courage, being the mother of all virtues because without hmm. It you cannot be consistent. They perform with other, you know. Courage is a, as Aristotle. I remember saying it. It's the key to all the human virtue, and so you certainly you know acknowledge that that calling to be courageous in a way. It's a calling, really. That calling is very vague, as we know. Uh, it's heroic in and also it's very artistic. You know, Donna. Mm -hmm. I, I remember reading an interpretation of uh, a Buddha somehow being equated in the same footing as William Blake. And William Blake fought Buddha and Christ and Mohammed or artists. So interesting. So mm -hmm. for your own journey, um, we have a story to tell um, and you learn how to make film. My question is very practical, Rudy. How did you uh, manage to meet up with the legendary Jackie and Sam Bisbee? who run a picture that were created in the late 90s. Yes, you know, I, I, I always want to, I'm so glad you brought that up because Sam uh, Bisbee and Jackie Bisbee have, have had such a big part of my life, such a profound part of my life. I actually met them, you know, I was saying earlier that I was a kindergarten teacher. I taught their daughter, Lucy, who's now at Vassar, um, oh. it, when she was four years old. So I got to know them way back then. And, you know, uh, Sam and I became friends. Sam is a musician, a singer songwriter, and he used to play at the living room and played all these great, really cool places on the Lower East Side. And this was when I had first moved to New York City. And it was a place for me to take my now wife uh, out on dates. And, and we used to go and watch him play all the time. And we sort of struck up a friendship. And, um, you know, I taught for another year or so and you know, remained affiliated with the school. So I got to know them a little bit more and more and through his music. And I always knew that they were, um, you know, at the time were making commercials uh, at Park Pictures, but then Sam eventually started making feature films and had a wonderful run at Sundance of a, of a ton of amazing films that, that they'd done on the feature scripted side. Yeah. And, you know, we became friends, you know, throughout that process. And 
I, I always say, you know, during the course of making the sentence over the nine and a half years, I, I always say, you know, I made it myself, but I had a, a very small group of people that I would show footage to, Sam and Jackie being two of the like five that yeah. over the 10 years saw some of that footage. And so, but later on, and this is like, this is a long story, but like, so they kind of became these like emotional producers for me where I would, I felt comfortable sharing footage with them and they were, you know, responding and like helping me navigate, you know, some of the things that I was trying to navigate both on the political side, but also on the filmmaking side. And later on down the road when, you know, I don't know if everyone's seen the film or not, but when after nine and a half years, the ending of the film sort of presents itself to me. And I'm like, I have an end now. You know, there were a couple of other producers that I'd shown things to. And all of a sudden, this, this information that I'd been making this film and that I had this really crazy ending yeah. sort of got out there. And people were like calling me and be like, listen, we want to give you money. We want to bring you money. We want to get in the, and like all of these places were calling and producers were calling me. And I call Sam and Jackie and, you know, and they said, listen, Rudy, we, we know you're getting a lot of um, inquiries or, get, you know, a lot of people are, are wanting to help you finish this film. I said, listen, we're here for you for anything that you need. Mm -hmm. And, and that meant a ton, you know, because you know, I respected them so much as artists and then who they were as people. And they said, you know, I said, listen, the only thing I'm looking for in this process is final cut. Like, I, I want to be able to tell the story that's in my heart. And I remember Sam looking across the table at me and he said, listen, we'll help you finish this film and you make the film that you need to make and you have final cut. And so we didn't go with the networks. We didn't go with all these things. I went with Sam and Jackie and Park Pictures and they said that here, here's a space for you to tell the film that is in your heart. And I owe a ton of the, the latitude that I was given in telling this story to them because I couldn't have finished it on my own. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and, and it would have been probably disastrous to have gone to a network or to another big entity like because you know a lot of cooks in the kitchen would have come and, and told me what I needed to make. And Sam and Jackie really gave me that opportunity to be a true storyteller. So, you know, I, I, I give a, I give a lot of credit to them and, and, and you know, they, they really helped me put this out for the world the way that I wanted to. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. yeah. There's Sam. <laughs> There's Sam. Yeah, you know, in um, her Nobel, is Sam here? Yeah, yeah. Sam's here. In her um, Nobel Prize speech, I think it might have been in 93, Toni Morrison said him very profound, she said, the first sentence of our childhood, we all remember the phrase, one upon a time. Yeah. So story, storytelling or narrative of our life, where we, be, where we get started, how we survive the formation early on, privilege or not privilege, <laughs> going through towards a certain realization of the self, quote unquote self, you know, the selfhood, the, the void, the journey, so to speak. It's so profound, you know, it's so profound. Just uh, apropos to Sundance, just a, a side note here. I once was a studio mate of Shauna Redford, Robert Redford's daughter. So one day Robert Redford showed up, took us for lunch and whatnot, and just learned quickly that he studied painting at Pratt Institute. So the, again, the artistic impulse is all, I'm sure philosophically was the, foundation for Sundance as you are your own film. So thank you, Rudy. Thank, thank you. you. Back to you, Anya. Thank you, Fong. Uh, it's a great question. Rudy, I want to make sure we're we're good on time. Do you um, think you have time to take one more question? Okay, great. Um, we're yeah, going we to take a couple. We're, we can take a couple. It's fine. Okay, great. Um, so the next question will be from Madison, um, a production assistant at The Rail. Madison, the floor is yours. Hi, um, thank you so much for sharing, you know, this journey with us. Uh, my question is about your background as an actor. Do you think uh, what tools that you pulled for that you pulled from that background as an actor as you transitioned into being a documentarian? Like, did you did it help broach difficult topics, or did it require like a completely new skill set of communication skills? Yeah, you know, I think that. Um... My, th thank you for that question. I think that my background as an actor 
character has shaped me as a storyteller in a pretty profound way because, you know, not to, you know, age myself too much, but when I was coming up as an actor, you know, it was pretty limited. Like there wasn't, there, there, there wasn't this idea of I could go out and be anything as an actor. You know, when, when I was doing theater in college, especially, there was this trend of, you know, because I was, you know, classically trained, I, I did Shakespeare, Moliere, like all, all of these, and, and, and I was okay, I was pretty good. And I would get cast in a lot of things and they would always say, oh, this is colorblind casting. Like this is, we're gonna make, and, and you're the lead of this, you know, show and you're this and you're this. And I was like, oh, great. So, so it's not, a, not an issue. And then as soon as I get cast and they're marketing, they're like, look at this Mexican guy who's doing Shakespeare. And it's like, what, like, why do you like, what can I just be, can I just be? Like, you know, and so I, 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 I take that to my storytelling now. You know, the, the sentence is about a family dealing with mass incarceration and the ramifications that that, that that has on the community, on themselves, on this country. And it's not about a Mexican family. We're a Mexican family, but we are part of the fabric of this community. And I just finished another uh, series for Netflix uh, last year that came out in January um, called We Are the Brooklyn Saints. And Immediately when that project was brought to me, I said, I'm not interested in telling another woe is me uh, tale of four kids from East New York, Brooklyn, who we need to come in and save. I have no desire of telling that story. I want to go in and say, you are great. You are kings. You are heroes in your own story without asterisk. You're not a great Black coach. You're not a great Black player. You're a great coach. You're a great player. And all of that that idea of telling those stories comes from me not wanting to be that like really good Mexican actor or that really good Mexican improvisational actor, that really good Mexican comedian. I'm a good comedian. I'm a good director. I'm a good storyteller. I don't want that asterisk. And that is all comes from that always being put on me as I was navigating the world of acting. So. In that sense, it is it is it is it, it, it impresses it puts upon what I'm doing now. But I think from a, a, a technical standpoint, acting was for me was reading and diving and failing, reading, diving, failing, choices, 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 making choices, failing, 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 failing. I learned that as an actor. I learned that as a comedian. I learned that as a writer. And so I, I was able to come into documentary with that ability to already be able to harness a story. I needed to catch up on the technical side, on the visual side, but I knew what a story was because of my time reading, writing, acting, failing, making a choice, reading, writing, failing, 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 failing. Um, so it all, it all lends to that sort of creative force, that filtration system that you create within yourself a failure becomes a part of your filtration system. And it shows up in watching the same scene 200 times. <laughs> yes. It shows up, I love it. Uh, one more question maybe. Yeah, we, we have a question from Elizabeth um, who will also be our, our poet today. Thanks, Anya. And thank you so much, Rudy, not only for making this film, but for speaking um, so eloquently and intimately with us about it today. Um, it's been a really wonderful conversation. Um, I really connected with you speaking about, um, you know, going into this project as a storyteller and not really knowing what would come out of it, but knowing that you sort of had to tell the story. Um, I'm wondering if you have any advice to give to any of us who might be storytellers across mediums about committing to telling a story when you really don't know what that road might be to telling it. Yeah, you know, that's that's something that, that's a great question because it's something that I think we all kind of wrestle with in, in creative endeavors. It's like we, we can oftentimes be clouded by the fact that, you know, where is this going to show? How is this going? Is this going to win an Emmy? Is this going to win an Oscar? And, and, I, and you know, I tend to have meetings with people who are like, you know, this could really be an Oscar, whatever, whatever. And I'm like, why are we talking about that right now? That has nothing to do with this creative process. Like, I don't think that I would be a filmmaker to this day or a storyteller to this day if every project that I started was contingent on it being award-winning. I, I do this because I love it. It's so much work. It's so much work, but it doesn't feel like that. And it's like, I, I think that that's, you know, we talk about calling earlier and I think like 
you find your calling in something and it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like anything. So I think as long as when you start a project and I struggle with it now because the type of projects that, I, that, that I'm doing now and that, I, that have been brought to me are different. They're structured differently than when I was making the sentence. When I was making the sentence and I was building my career and doing all these other projects, I would work for months, you know, weeks, months, years without getting paid because I was out there running and gunning and telling a story because I wanted to tell that story and I wanted to be a part of this grander narrative of who is putting these stories out into the world. That's what, that's what drives me in every single thing, thing that I do is that I want an opportunity because the winners of wars write history. I want to control this narrative. I want to be a part of writing some of this history and putting that out into the world. Not for me, for young me, for young me who was looking out to find people who looked like me in representation. That it really does matter. And so I find myself now, I'm starting a, it sounds like a total sellout, but I'm, I'm starting a six part series right now for Disney. And it's, it has a budget, it has all these things, it had all this stuff. But to me, I wanna grab a camera and just go start, start telling the story. I don't wanna care that I have X amount of shoot days. I don't wanna care that there's this thing happening here. I have this deadline and it's like, I need to go out and tell a story. And with that Netflix series that I did last year, it was the same thing. I was put in this box of like, here's the beginning, middle and end. And I was like, don't tell me about a box. And they said, you have X amount of shoot days. I said, don't tell me how many shoot days I have. I shoot, I shoot and I shoot and I shoot. And if it means me going out by myself with a camera and telling the story, I'm gonna do it. And you have to have that drive. You have to have that want, that need to tell something. Otherwise it's gonna become a job. And when it becomes a job, it becomes about money and it becomes about awards and it becomes about all these things that in all honesty, we have no control over. We have no control over how any of this is going to be. And it's one of the reasons why I don't read re reviews. I don't listen uh, to a lot of notes that come in because I'm a certain kind of storyteller. And if I put a project out there and somebody puts a review out there and they're saying, this is not this because of this, this, and this, I'm gonna internalize that and it's gonna shift the way I tell stories. I don't want to do that. I want to be as honest to the reason why I tell stories as possible. And that's all connected to why we do any of the things that we do. If you have to do something, if you need to do something, you're going to do it. If you want to do something, you'll think of reasons not to. Right. Thank you. I, Thank you, Elizabeth. I see why you got into Sundance. Have a great flight. I think we conclude. <laughs> Uh -huh. well, well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me truly. And, um, you know, one of the things that I just wanted to address about this and, and the one of the core things about the sentence and really, honestly, everything that I do, you know, when you watch the sentence, if you if you if you've already seen it and you want to watch it again, there are a lot of different layers there to it. But one of the most important layers that I think that is there is that, yes, it's about mandatory minimum sentencing. Yes, it's about my sister and her daughters and the fight for justice and all of those things. But at its core, if you look at it on its base level, it's about agency and voice. It's about somebody who in the first act didn't know how to tell a story, was chasing the story, trying to figure it out. By the middle of the film, my feet are under me and I'm starting to grasp what it means and the importance of I'm telling the story and by the end I'm commanding a story you get to see a growth of a voice throughout the process of 10 years of understanding that this is important and it's not important to tell a story it's important to continue to get better telling that story always be better you know one of the things that sticks to me every single day something that that drives me all of the time is you know when we were young and I don't like it to become part of my narrative because I think it's 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 um it does a disservice to who my parents were and who my family were, but we struggled. We were homeless. We had all of these things. We lived in cars. We lived in basements. We had all this stuff. And um, I remember waking up at four in the morning to go to somebody's basement to take a shower so that I could go to school. And, and my mom saying to me, today sucks. But you know what? Tomorrow is going to be better. So be better tomorrow. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rudy, for speaking so beautifully um, and giving us so much wisdom on this talk. And thank you, Reverend Dr. Scopper, for, for guiding us. You're um, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, Rudy, <laughs> I, I know you have to go. Um, 
but we end every uh, event here at the rail with a poetry reading. Um, and I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Elizabeth Lothian, who you've already heard on the stage. Elizabeth is the social media manager at the Brooklyn Rail and an assistant editor at Guernica. Her work has appeared in Book Forum, Lit Hub, Electric Literature and elsewhere. She holds an MFA in nonfiction from the New School where she was a creative writing fellow. So um, please, Elizabeth, close us out. Thank you so much, Anya. Uh, today, I'm going to be reading two poems by the great writer and political activist, Amiri Baraka. The first one is titled, One Plus One Equals One. Inside the music is like everywhere being everything. To tell a story is like that. Look at those eyes gone inside you, like the notes. Unseen, but alive as what always will be. The eyes of everyone you've ever seen begin where the sound alerts us. And what opens is the front of ourselves, staring back from behind your feelings. Inside the music, it is everybody understanding what exists. The devil can't get in. And the second one I'll be reading is Balboa, the entertainer. Mm -hmm. It cannot come except you make it from materials it is not caught from. The philosophers of need, of which I am lately one, will tell you, the people, and not think themselves liable to the same trembling flesh. I say now, the people, as some lesson repeated now, the lights are off to myself as a lover or at the cold wind. Let my poems be a graph of me and they keep to the line where flesh drops off. You will go blank at the middle, a dead man, but die soon, love, if what you have for yourself does not stretch to your body's end. Thank you, Elizabeth, for such wonderful selections. Um, to close us out, that was perfect. Thank you again, Reverend Dr. Scopper and, and Rudy for making time today to, to come uh, have this conversation with us. Um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel where we'll upload today's conversation. And you can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Adam Pendleton, Zoe Hopkins, and Amanda Glubizi. Um, we'll conclude with a poetry reading by Alma Birch. And you can now turn on your microphone to say thank you and goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rudy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rudy. Thanks, thank you, Donna. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy, for the film. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, thank, thank you all. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck and have a great flight. Yes, have a safe yes. flight. Have a great Good travels. Time. Yes. Thank you. Safe Thank travels. You. Bye. Bye, all. Bye. Bye, Bye Happy care. New Year. Hey, man. Hi. Hi, Jeannie. Hey. Hi, Jeannie. hey. We'll talk soon, okay? Bye, you guys. Bye.